Let us imagine the school in the clouds. The emerging future of learning. The future that we actually face today. The future that has become a reality. Have you ever heard of the term minimally invasive education? That is to say, a form of learning in which children operate in unsupervised environments. The term that can be attributed to the professor of educational technology at the School of Education, Communication and Language Sciences of the Newcastle University. As he once said, we know that people in future will work from wherever they want, whenever they want, in whatever way they want. Sugata Mitra has become internationally recognized as he came up with the idea of the school in the cloud, an educational program which he started in 2013 and which he describes as the global experiment in self-organized learning. Sugata Mitra is a person every kid wants to be their teacher. Unbelievably energized, always ready to leave you to your own devices. He calls his approach to education self-organized learning. At its core, it's all about sparking curiosity, about asking smart questions and then sitting back and letting pupils get to the answers with the help of their peers. I would like you to watch public speaking presentation by the professor where he shares his ideas on the process of learning. But firstly, let me clarify some words, definitions. Data is information, especially facts or numbers collected to be examined and considered. We can do several mathematical operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. The words robust means functional and reliable, whereas obsolete means outdated, no longer actual. To read discerningly means to read skillfully. A short glimpse at something means a brief outlook. An absurd proposition is an unreasonable statement. Hypothesis is an idea or explanation for something that is based on known facts. Not to have the foggiest idea means to know nothing. To troop in means to come in great numbers, together in a company. To pour over means to look at and study something carefully. Reluctantly uh, means unwillingly do something. A devastating question is a question causing extreme emotional pain. To sort things out means to solve problems. To emerge is to appear. To stand back in awe means to stand back in a feeling of respect and amazement. So now let us turn to the video itself. It is an extract from the TED talk by Sugata Mitra. which is called the future of learning. Watch attentively as after the film you are to do several tasks. What is going to be the future of learning? I do have a plan. But in order for me to tell you what that plan is, 
Um, I need to tell you a little story which kind of sets the stage. I tried to look at where did uh, the kind of learning we do in schools, where did it come from? And, you know, you can look far back into the past, but if you look at present-day schooling the way it is, it's quite easy to figure out where it came from. It came from about 300 years ago. And it came from the last and the biggest of the empires on this planet. Imagine trying to run the show, trying to run the entire planet without computers, without telephones, with data handwritten on pieces of paper and traveling by ships. But the Victorians actually did it. What they did was amazing. They created a global computer made up of people. It's still with us today. It's called the bureaucratic administrative machine. <laughs> In order to have that machine running, you need lots and lots of people. They made another machine to produce those people, the school. The schools would produce the people who would then become parts of the bureaucratic administrative machine. They must be identical to each other. They must know three things. They must have good handwriting, because the data is handwritten. They must be able to read and they must be able to do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction in their head. They must be so identical that you could pick one up from New Zealand and ship them to Canada, and he would be instantly functional. The Victorians were great engineers. They engineered a system that was so robust that it's still with us today. Continuously producing identical people for a machine that no longer exists. The empire is gone. So what are we doing with that design that produces these identical people? And what are we going to do next if we ever are going to do anything else with it? So that's a pretty strong comment there. I said schools as we know them now, they're obsolete. I'm not saying they're broken. It's quite fashionable to say that the education system is broken. It's not broken. It's wonderfully constructed. It's just that we don't need it anymore. It's outdated. What's the kind of jobs that we have today? Well, the clerks are the computers. They're there in thousands in every office. And you have people who guide those computers to do their clerical jobs. Those people don't need to be able to write beautifully by hand. They don't need to be able to multiply numbers in their heads they do need to be able to read. In fact, they need to be able to read discerningly. Well, that's today. But we don't even know what the jobs of the future are going to look like. We know that people will work from wherever they want, whenever they want, in whatever way they want. How is present-day schooling going to prepare them for that world? Well, I bumped into this whole thing completely by accident. I used to teach people how to write computer programs in New Delhi 14 years ago. And right next to where I used to work, there was a slum. And I used to think, how, how on earth are those kids ever going to learn to write computer programs? Or are they, should they not? At the same time, we also had lots of parents, rich people, who had computers, and who used to tell me, you know, my son, um, I think he's gifted because, you know, he does wonderful things with computers. And my daughter, oh, surely she, she's, you know, extra intelligent, and so on. So I suddenly figured that how come all the rich people are having these extraordinary gifted children? <laughs> <laughs> what did the poor do wrong? <laughs> I made a hole in the, in the boundary wall of the slum next to my office, and I stuck a computer inside it just to see what would happen if I gave a computer to children who never would have one, didn't know any English, didn't know what the internet was. The children came running in, it was three feet off the ground, and they said, what is this? And I said, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> they said, um, why have you put it there? I said, just like that. And they said, can we touch it? I said, if you wish to. And I went away. 
About eight hours later, we found them browsing and teaching each other how to browse. So I said, but that's impossible. Because, you know, how, how is it possible? They, they don't, don't know anything. My colleagues said, no, it's a simple solution. One of your students must have been passing by, showed them how to use the mouse. So I said, yeah, that's possible. So I repeated the experiment. I went 300 miles out of Delhi into a really remote village where the chances of a, you know, a passing software development engineer <laughs> were, was, was, was very little. <laughs> I repeated the experiment there. There was no place to stay, so I stuck my computer in, I went away, came back after a couple of months, found kids playing games on it. When they saw me, they said, we want a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> you know? so, so, so I said, how on earth do you know all this? And they said something very interesting to me. In an irritated voice, they said, you've given us a machine that works only in English, so we had to teach ourselves English in order to use it. <laughs> so, I, that's the first time as a teacher that I heard the word teach ourselves said so casually. Here's a, here's a short glimpse from those years. That's the first day at the hole in the wall. On your right is an eight-year-old. Um, to his left is his uh, student. Um, uh, she is six. And uh, he's teaching her how to browse. Then on to the... Uh, you know, other parts of the country, I repeated this over and over again, getting exactly the same results everywhere. An eight-year-old telling his elder sister what to do. <laughs> and finally, a girl explaining in Marathi what it is, and said, there's a processor inside. So I started publishing. I published everywhere. I wrote down, I measured everything, and I said, in nine months, a group of children left alone with a computer in any language would reach the same standard as an office secretary in the West. I'd seen it happen over and over and over again. So then people said, well, how far will it go? Where does it stop? I decided I would I would destroy my own argument by creating an absurd proposition. I made a hypothesis, a ridiculous hypothesis. Tamil is a South Indian language, and I said, can Tamil-speaking children in a South Indian village learn the biotechnology of DNA replication in English from a street-side computer? And I said, I'll measure them, they'll get a zero, I'll spend a couple of months, I'll leave it for a couple of months, I'll go back, they'll get another zero, I'll go back to the lab and say, we need teachers. I found a village. It was called Kali Kuppam in southern India. Uh, I put in hole in the wall computers there, downloaded all kinds of stuff from the internet about DNA replication, most of which I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, the children came rushing and said, what's all this? So I said, um, it's very topical, very important. It's all in English. So they said, how can we understand such big English words and you know, diagrams and chemistry? So by now, I had developed a new pedagogical method, so I applied that. I said, I haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, I'm going away. <laughs> so I, I left them for a couple of months. They got a zero, I gave them a test. I came back after two months, and the children trooped in and said, we've understood nothing. So I said, well, I mean, what did I expect? So I said, OK, but um, how long did it take you before you decided that you can't understand anything? So they said, we haven't given up. We look at it every single day. So I said, what? You don't understand these screens, and you keep staring at it for two months. What for? So a little girl, who you'll see just now, she raised her hand, and she says to me in broken Tamil and English, she said, well, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes disease, we haven't understood anything else. <laughs> so, I tested them. I got an educational impossibility, 0 to 30 percent in two months in the tropical heat under, with a computer under the tree in a language that they didn't know, doing something that's a decade ahead of their time. Absurd, but, but I had to follow the Victorian norm. 30% is a fail. <laughs> How do I get them to pass? 
I have to get them 20 more marks. I couldn't find a teacher. What I did find was a friend that they had, a 22-year-old girl who was an accountant, and she played with them all the time. So I asked this girl, can you help them? So she says, uh, absolutely not. I, I, didn't, I didn't have science in school. I have no idea what they're doing under that tree all day long. I, I, I can't help you. I said, um, I'll tell you what, use the method of the grandmother. So she says, what's that? I said, stand behind them. Whenever they do anything, you just say, well, wow, I mean, how did you do that? What's the next page? Gosh, when I was your age, I could have never done that. I mean, you know what grannies do. So <laughs> she did that for two more months. The scores jumped to 50%. <laughs> Kali Kuppam had caught up with my control school in New Delhi, a rich private school with a trained biotechnology teacher. When I saw that graph, I knew there is a way to level the playing field. Here's Kali Kumpa. Neuron, 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 cell death, and life. Neuron, the communication, neuron. I got the camera angle wrong in that, that one, it's just amateur stuff, but what she was saying, uh, as you could make out, was about neurons, but her hands were like that, and she was saying, neurons communicate at 12. So, what are jobs going to be like? Well, we know what they're like today. What's learning going to be like? We know what it's like today, children poring over with their mobile phones on the one hand, and then reluctantly going to school to, to pick up their books with the other hand. Um, what will it be tomorrow? Could it be that we don't need to go to school at all? Could it be that at the point in time when you need to know something, you can find out in two minutes? Could it be a devastating question, a question that was framed for me by Nicholas Negroponte? Could it be that we are heading towards, or maybe in, a future when knowing is obsolete? I came back to England looking for British grandmothers. I put out notices in papers saying, if you're a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a web camera, can you give me one hour of your time per week for free? I got 200 in the first two weeks. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> They're called the granny cloud. The granny cloud sits on the internet. If there's a child in, in trouble, we beam a gran. She goes, over, she goes on over Skype, and she sorts things out. I've seen them do it from a village called Diggles in uh, northwestern England, uh, deep inside a village in Tamil Nadu, India, 6,000 miles away, she does it with only one age-old gesture. <laughs> okay. Watch this. You can't catch me. You say it. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Well done. Very good. <laughs> So what's happening here? I think what we need to look at is we need to look at learning as the product of educational self-organization. If you allow the educational process to self-organize, then learning emerges. It's not about making learning happen, it's about letting it happen. The teacher sets the, the process in motion, and then she stands back in awe and watches as learning happens. I think that's what all this is pointing at. But how will we know? How will we come to know? Well, I intend to build these self-organized learning environments. They are basically broadband, collaboration, and encouragement put together. I've tried this in many, many schools. So here are a couple of images from souls. I've tried incredible, incredible questions. When did the world begin? Uh, how will it end? To nine-year-olds. Yeah, this one's about what happens to the air we breathe. This is done by children without the help of any teacher. The teacher only raises the question and then stands back and admires the answer. So, what's my wish? My wish is that we design the future of learning 
We don't want to be spare parts for a great human computer, do we? So we need to design a future for learning. And I've got to, hang on, I've got to get this wording exactly right, because, you know, it's very important. My wish is to help design a future of learning by supporting children all over the world to tap into their wonder and their ability to work together. Help me build this school. It will be called the School in the Cloud. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. You are to answer the questions. How did the present model for schools in Western nations come about? What machine did the Victorians create? What three skills were needed to make this machine work? What positive adjective does Sugata Mitri use to describe this system of education? Why are the three skills no longer needed? According to Sugata Mitra, which skill do people still need, but nowadays in a discerning way? Make notes about the first experiment that was carried out by the professor. What rich parents say about their children? The question to be answered by the experiment. The results after eight hours. The possible floor in the experiment. The location of the second experiment. What children were doing after two months. The extra hurdle the students had to overcome. Sugata Mitra's published conclusion. Now let us turn to the next task. You are to choose the correct options to complete the description. Please explain the topical things. Why we won't need to go to school in the future. What the granny cloud is. What the granny's role is in learning. And finally, complete the quotations from the talk. It's not about something. Learning happen. It's about it happen. I intend to build these self-organized learning environments. They are basically something, collaboration and something else put together. The teacher only raises something and then stands back and admires something else. My wish is to help design for learning by supporting children all over the world to tap into their and their ability to work together. Please watch the clips from the TED talk and choose the correct meaning. What does set the stage mean? Gives the background to something, shows something in a favorable way or shows the cultural context of a thing. So the correct answer is A, gives the background to something. They do need to be able to read. In fact, they need to be able to read discerning. What does discerningly mean? Fast and accurately, widely, and with cultural awareness, carefully and with good judgment. Discerningly means carefully and with good judgment. Here's a, here's a short glimpse from those years. 
What does a short glimpse mean? A little experience, a quick film, a brief look. A short glimpse is a brief look. The children came rushing and said, what's all this? So I said, um, it's very topical, very important. It's all in English. What does topical mean? True and accurate, current and relevant, interesting and eye-opening. It is actually current and relevant. When I saw that graph, I knew there is a way to level the playing field. What does level the playing field mean? Give each player the same opportunity of success. Make the race or competition less difficult. Abandon old ideas and make a fresh start. It means to give each player the same opportunity of success. We know what it's like today, children poring over with their mobile phones on the one hand and then reluctantly going to school to, to pick up their books with the other hand. What does poring over mean? Examining closely, playing distractedly with reading excitedly. To pour over means to examine closely. Watch the clips from the talk and complete the collocations. What they did was amazing. They created a global computer made of people. What they did was amazing. They created a global computer made up of people. To be made up of someone or something. How is present-day schooling going to prepare them for that world? Well, I bumped into this thing completely by accident. How is present-day schooling going to prepare them for that world? Well, I bumped into this whole thing completely by accident. So, the collocation is to bump into the whole thing by accident. So I suddenly figured that how come all the rich people are having these gifted children? So I suddenly figured that how come all the rich people are having these extraordinary gifted children? This extraordinarily gifted children. One of your students must have been passing, show them how to use the mouse. One of your students must have been passing by, showed them how to use the mouse. To pass by. I repeated this several times, means I repeated this over and over again. To repeat over and over again. I said I haven't the slightest idea. What is the synonym to this expression? I said I haven't the foggiest idea.
So what does the teacher do? The teacher does something and then she stands back. The teacher sets the process in motion and then she stands back. We don't want to be some kinds of parts for a great human computer, do we? We don't want to be spare parts for a great human computer, do we? Spare parts. We finally come up to the home assignments. That will be to summarize the public speech of Sugata Mitra. You should write at least 15 sentences. And the second task will be to write an argumentative composition on the topic school in the future. 200 words. Please don't forget to follow the plan. The first part of which should be an introductory part where you should state the problem. The main body consists of your opinion with argumentation and the final part conclusion. So in this part you should restate your opinion once again. Please send your homeworks to your teachers via emails not later than the 11th of April.